Wayne Sharp. I'm the uh, chairman and founder of Carbon Trade Exchange. Very good. And um, what connects you with uh, COP21? Well, I've been coming to the COPs. In fact, I conceptualised the vision and created the idea of Carbon Trade Exchange at the COP in Bali. Uh, I was invited there for an entire, entirely different reason. I'd invented a formula for businesses' sustainability and uh, World Business Council of Sustainable Development invited me along. Uh, and when I went there, the previous company that I'd uh, built and ran for 21 years, called Bartercard, uh, I'd never seen any connection until I got to that cop between what I'd been doing for that long period of time and billions of dollars worth of trade and the, uh, and the environmental section, but that was what, where my passion lay. So obviously you found you are the founder of CTX, yeah. which you founded then um, back at the, the, the previous COP. Um, could you briefly explain what CTX does? Sure. Well, I'll explain how I devised the, pro the ch found the problem first, and that is that the, the, the carbon markets are very diverse, and the projects that are actually doing something to solve climate change, uh, part of their, an important part of their financing comes from carbon credits. But in order to sell their carbon credits, a lot of them were having to go to big expositions and travel around the world trying to promote themselves, uh, which is very expensive, time consuming. The first time I went to Carbon Expo, which was back in 2008, to me it was like a modern day medieval market with everyone bringing their chickens and goats, right? And I thought, haven't these people heard of the internet? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, you know, I built technology uh, for the barter industry uh, and that, I'll show you the card, right? And I thought even then with barter, that's the barter card, right? Nice. Um, and I thought in that instance, you know, why wouldn't it, shouldn't barter be like American Express, where you can just use it over the counter in a business and it's not a cash transaction? Well, that's exactly what happened. Forty billion dollars later, I sold that to my management so I could focus on the environmental business. So what Carbon Trade Exchange does, a long way to answer your question, <laughs> is we provide an exchange-based facility where we don't own the credits, but any project can list their credits for sale, and we promote them electronically to buyers on, on an exchange platform that operates 24-7 anywhere in the world, wherever you're connected to the internet. So that means that you can buy electronically a large different range of credits in very small quantities. So normally, in the carbon market, you only buy a very, you know, five thousand tons is mm -hmm. about the smallest over-the-counter transaction that's viable to do for what, anybody. What price are we talking about, for example? The price isn't the issue. The issue is that unless it's at least that sort of quantum, uh, you know, maybe ten thousand to fifty thousand euros, maybe, right? Then it's not financially viable, you know. And and most of the transactions need to be larger than that in the over-the-counter market at a wholesale level. We do a trade for as little as 100 tonnes electronically. I don't make much money on those trades, probably none really, but you know, little fish are sweet as they say in the classics and we, we want a lot of trades. Still our average transaction size is between three and a half and 5,000 tonnes, but that includes a lot of one and 200 tonne trades. So the most important thing for me was that if you want to solve climate change, most of the finance needs to go to the projects, not to some broker who's sitting in the middle leveraging a bit of capital against some poor starving seagull down there trying to plant trees or mm -hmm. do some other environmental project uh, uh, in, in, a, in a remote jurisdiction. So we charge a 5% commission on what we sell and we bundle all the fees up so there's no bank fees, there's mm -hmm. no legals, there's no nothing, it's all done electronically. Now, now, let's talk about the, the, that, that mission. Like, does CTX and its commercialized uh, technology platform contribute actually to the, to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions? Massively. I mean, what I realized, my previous business, Buttercard, was a business-to-business -business exchange platform. So I understand how businesses are motivated. At any given time, we have over 100,000 businesses trading on that exchange. And we operate in 20 countries. So, and businesses' motivations are similar everywhere. So even if they want to do something environmental, they don't want it to be difficult, otherwise they may not do it. If it's costly, 
difficult to do or takes a lot of their time away from the business that they're actually engaged in, they may not do it. There's too many obstacles. So therefore, you only get a very small percentage of extremely passionate business people that offset their emissions. If, however, you make a technology solution that's easy to use, cost effective, simple to get into and simple to buy what you want from where you want, then it's easy. For a big corporate, they usually don't want to buy one type of cr credit anyway. They want to buy a portfolio, so they're appealing to everybody. I mean, you might care about renewable energy, you might want to hug trees, you might want to worry about, you know, little African guys with cook stoves. Well, whatever it is, we want to, we want to be able to say, you buy what you want, not what we want to sell you. Very good. Uh, CTX is currently um, active in America, Australia and the EU. You want to even broaden your horizon. Um, can you also already see some kind of shifts in those markets, like in those nations? Well, I think the EU, there was a lot of offsetting going on uh, until the global financial crisis, which hit Europe harder than anybody. And so a lot of companies withdrew, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the American market, they're just starting now to try and come into that. They're, they're waking up to the opportunity for the corporate social responsibility. So we're a member of the Climate Registry and participate uh, as a major sponsor of the Climate Leadership Conference in the US. And the big organisations are, are thinking they want to reduce their footprint first. Well, I don't think we have time for that. You know, what I say is measure first, price carbon within your business, so you know where the costs and the emissions are coming from. Then reduce, and then you see the financial benefits and you know what you've put into your bottom line in, co in direct cost savings, and of course, you're carbon neutral, you're carbon zero, so you're able to say, we did the right thing to your consumers. Are there any speculators in the carbon market? Not in the voluntary market, really, and in the regulated market, like the EU ETS, there were speculators when the spot markets were operating. Now, very few would risk speculation on a futures contract unless you really know what you're doing. So the only people doing that are the utilities or the people who have to trade anyway. Mm -hmm. Generally, the, 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 every bank had a carbon desk if you went back in 2000, you know, 2008, even, right? Um, they all had carbon desks. So there were, if you call it a desk, which could be 10 guys, not one person, right? Mm. Uh, a carbon desk, there were over 500 in Europe when there were four spot exchanges operating. Mm -hmm. Since the spot exchanges have shut down and there's only futures exchanges left till we come along again, then basically there are now about 100 desks and most of those are owned or controlled by the utilities. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that's had a big impact on price because the speculators would like the price to go up, the utilities would like it to go down because that costs them less money to be doing what they have to do by regulation anyway. So needless to say in a utility controlled market or a, a, an emitter controlled market the price is significantly pressed. I'm not surprised at all. So we think when we reactivate our spot exchange will change the macro dynamics of the market in Europe within another year or two. I think there's a lot of positive reasons it'll go up anyway, but we think we'll have a big big impact on that. Do we see the conventional, for now it's only future contracts that we can... Uh, no, no, no. We, we, our, our, all of our platforms are spot platforms. Okay. So what we do, it doesn't mean we won't trade futures in the future, <laughs> but uh, uh, more likely genuine futures, like you know, for in the regulated market, a December 15th delivery, not a, a, a five day future. To me, you know, it might be the future, but it's not the sort of future I envisage when people start trading futures contracts. Um, now, America, Australia, you, what comes next? Which markets and why? Well. Those are pretty big, so that's, that's a lot of attention to pay. In the voluntary market, we have clients from all over the world already, over 30 countries, um, buyers and sellers from both. So we, we don't, we're not restricted from where we can sell. The, the voluntary market's a global platform that operates 24-7. Um, and, we, and we have an office in Singapore for that as well. Um, but for the regulated markets, you need to be on the ground in that market. 
So obviously we're doing, you know, the US and, and the EU as our main focal point at this point. And I don't see that we'll be doing any new regional markets in the near future. Um, we could technically support the Chinese market, for example, but I don't really look Chinese enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some environmental qualities. Um, could you simply explain why would companies invest in global environmental commodities? Well, they're not really investing. What they're doing is they're making a decision to remove their environmental impact from the planet's ecosystem. That's the reality of what an offset does. So I don't really see that it's an investment. It's basically it's an investment in their own corporate social responsibility, their own sustainability, and in sending the right message out to the business and or consumer community that wants to do or should do business with them. It also gives them the ability to control the impact their supply chain has on the environment. And you know whether we like to think about it or not, the global ecosystem is what every business is dependent on in order for survival for the future. So if they want to be in business 20 years from now, then they better be starting to think about what impact what they do today has in 20 years' time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about environmental commodities, uh, what kind of commodities do we need to think of? Well, we've started with carbon because the markets existed, right? And when we went into the voluntary market first, the reason we did that is because no one was servicing it, and I don't know if I could afford to compete with the people who were in the regulated market at the time. So that was a combination of reasons. The carbon market's already there. They're already you know, either very large in the case of the EU ETS or global in the case of the voluntary market. And what we've done is brought transparency, security, liquidity and efficiency to those markets that, that they didn't have before. My next visions include renewable energy certificates, which we've already built an exchange for that in Australia, and we're going to do it in America as well, and Europe. Um, water exchange, which I've built in Australia, it's operating, um, which we're hoping in the future that'll come in other markets. Biomass, biodiversity credits is another one we think will come down the track somewhere, and those are operating in a highly inefficient manner, but usually on a regional or state basis at best. So basically when I designed the technology I thought well I want to be able to add in any environmental instrument and you know even if I invented the instrument I wouldn't want to be the registry we'd rather have that being done by a third party or by a government body or something like that and we'll operate the exchange mechanics and create the the central exchange that allows brokers banks registry services to to link into which is what we've done so far is, is it regulated as a, as a conventional stock market? No, of course not, because the, the, acti the activities of a stock market are regulated because the instruments are regulated. That's the reason. So if you have a financial instrument like shares, well then that's a regulated activity. An exchange has the highest level of, of regulation and then the brokers have the next highest and so on down, and, and all the way down to the representatives that work for those brokers all have to be licensed. That's not the case in the carbon markets. It wasn't the case in the barter market either. So we did self-regulation to make sure that we could run a global robust solution. That, well, while I ran it for 21 years, did 35, 40 million transactions. <laughs> um, now, now some critics are saying that, that um, trading in commodities leads to greenwashing. What would your comment be on that? Well, yeah, I don't agree. I, the, the, the two aren't, they're, they're, not, they're not the same thing. There's a lot of companies that talk about activity in the, in the, in the sector that don't actually do anything uh, and aren't really doing anything positive of note. And that, to me, is greenwashing. If someone is offsetting their emissions, particularly if they've gone carbon neutral, they've gone and purchased, and let's not forget, the process is this. They buy the credits and then they retire them. Now, if it's a allowances in Europe, that's to meet their obligation, which is a continuously declining obligation. So 
whilst, yes, a lot of them have been given some of those allowances, they have to buy the difference if they don't reduce far enough. So it's a stick and a carrot, right? In the voluntary market, they're buying voluntary uh, uh, credits off their exchange platform and retiring them to cancel whatever impact they're having on, on the planet's ecosystem. No business can get to zero emissions. It's not possible. So that, that, it, it, no matter how good they get at reducing their footprint, they'll never get to zero. Frankly, they won't ever make a significant impact unless they offset first. We have massive amounts of evidence that the companies that do offsetting then reduce, reduce their carbon footprint by monumentally larger amounts. A company that just says, I want to reduce my emission footprint, lucky if they can do a 5% reduction. Companies that do offsetting first, 50, 60% is not unheard of within two to three years. It's a massive difference because you price carbon within your business. And that means it's like anything in business. You've got to, if you know where the problems are, then you know what to focus on to fix it and how to go about doing so. Now we're here at the Sustainable Innovation Forum, but basically this is the side event of the COP21. Sure. What is your goal here in Paris? <clears throat> well, we're also sponsoring the, the business hub in, the, uh, in, in COP21, uh, which is World Business Council of Sustainable Development and the International Mission Trading Association, which we're members of both. Sorry, and the Carbon Market Investors Association, which we're also a member of. <laughs> and that's got 250 side events going on in that, in that stand, and they're two, they're two hallway, tall things. Our purpose here is to build more liquidity and build more, more volume. This is, you know, yes, I really care about saving the planet, but I've got to make money doing it. I've got governments or some charity or anyone giving me money. I've had to make it and then put it into this business, so I've got to make money. Uh, but I think it's reasonable that if you do the most to save the planet, you could be one of the richest people on it, right? <laughs> is, is, carbon, is, carbon going to, uh, is carbon pricing going to be easier now that the liquidity picks up? as more businesses are buying? Look, a lot of people talk about wanting to have carbon markets. They don't really understand what they're saying. They're just saying we want it to happen as if they mysteriously appear. Uh, and, and mysteriously appear, I should say. Um, and in terms of linkage as well, internationally, everyone says, oh, you know, if I only had one big global carbon market. Well, that's just not going to happen. It just isn't going to happen, ever. And I don't know that we want it to happen, because if we want to get the maximum amount of flow of finance, which is really what this is all about, into the environmental sector, we have to have big liquid markets that are capable of interacting with each other, but don't necessarily link the whole time, right? Because the brokers also, if they want to trade that, they need to make money. So they need to be able to have expertise in the arbitrage between those markets where the opportunity exists to trade. That, that brings the financial services sector into it, which takes it from a niche market to gigantic, which is where it's going to go. No? Um, are you also um, influencing the negotiations happening in Le Bourget in some, some way? Well, unfortunately, I'm Australian, so the government there doesn't listen to anything that anybody says, much less me. Um, and I know that because I've looked the minister in the eye and know that he's as deaf as that piece of machinery over there, right? I think there are people there to listening. I think there are many that aren't. They already have formed their views before they came. They didn't come there to listen, learn, interact, understand, nothing. They just came there to, to pump their position. So what we do is we're trying to encourage everyone to understand that there are technological solutions that you don't have, they don't have to wait for the government to invest or invent technology or how the market operates. Make the bloody rules and we'll come along and operate it. How about that? <laughs> Bum. <laughs> Do you have any final questions? Well, yeah, I was just wondering, um, now that the, the oil, fly, oil, oil, oil prices are really low, do you see carbon prices also uh, decreasing? No, I don't. The two aren't linked. I mean, if you look at the EU ETS, the, 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 the price of carbon is going that way and the price of oil is going that way. Yeah. So that's, they're not no, linked. They're not linked. Um, 
the advantage we've got with, uh, with uh, the, the reduction in oil price and the depression and continued you know, destructive implosion of the coal and fossil fuel industry sectors, thank you, um, is countries and companies are more motivated to transition to renewable energy. Right? So that, you know, everywhere other than the Darth Vader that is Australia, our government, you know, everywhere else they're seeing the light and, and transitioning that. They're trying to transition their economy as much as possible. You know, if China probably had come into this whole uh, uh, emergence process just five years later, I could guarantee you that their economy would probably be 80% renewables. They just went crazy with coal because Australia was shoving it down their throat for, you know, one cent a friggin' ton or something. <laughs> okay. uh, final question. Let's say we meet again uh, in five years, the next big cup. Uh, what has changed in the past five years? Well, I don't doubt that there'll be an agreement from here, but I also don't doubt that every single government person here has recognised they need business to engage more, not just the regulator. Because the regulations impact only the big emitters, and they forget that the main consumers of their product, electricity, is the rest of the business community. So impact them, force them to force change back up the supply chain. So that's what that's what I think the governments are starting to understand. that. They previously, the business was sitting there saying, we need regulation, we need pricing, we need consistency, and no one was listening properly. And then the, 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 the utilities and fossil fuel companies had too much money and too much negotiating power and plenty of time, right, because that shit ain't going away. It's sitting in the ground waiting to be dug up or sucked out. So, you know, all of a sudden they don't, they don't care, right? So in this case, the business community is starting to realise their customers are saying, I want action, and the businesses are seeing risks to their business, which they know they need to start taking action. And let's face it, as the, you know, the global climate changes, it's changing destructively and hurting people and hurting businesses on a big scale and increasingly larger scale. So we haven't even got to dangerous climate change yet. Wait till we get to catastrophic. So we don't want to get there. And business is finally starting to, to have that voice.